Hey guys. All right, we are continuing the emotional validation series. And I'm just looking over my notes. Today we're talking about compromise. So just to recap real quick, um, I've, I just finished working out and this is my reward. Actually, what I'm trying to say is before I take a shower, finishing this video is going to be my reward to take the shower. <laughs> Um, I don't know why I felt the need to like I said, but sometimes you have to do those like mental games to like stick to your, your goals, your like calendar. Um, okay. Back to you all and emotional validation. <laughs> all right. So if you did not watch the last video, I will link it below. I will also link the corresponding, um, written piece that I'm going to do with this video, but my big concern here is, is that people are operating and making decisions in a way where someone else is controlling them and they don't realize it. They don't realize the decisions of staying, of going, of working, of raising kids, whatever you have going on is because someone else is validating something within them that they have rejected and abandoned. So when we continue in these situations to the naked eye, they're like, what the hell is going on with so-and-so? And it looks like, why would they put up with that? How is this happening? They never used to be this way. But it's all speaking to a need within them. Okay. And when they're not meeting themselves mentally, emotionally, energetically, whatever it is, someone else recognizes it and then they feel connected to that person. They feel seen and they will sacrifice a lot in their life just to keep that one thread. So there's five different ways we do this <laughs> where we are doing these really negative byproducts of being emotionally validated in a way we haven't given ourselves. So the five just feel like grooving a little bit tonight. Um, so the five things are compromise, toleration, blind spots, isolation, and news stories. Okay. So today's video is on compromise. Now, I'm probably going to go back and forth between my draft and my notes here, but I do want to start off by saying that making joint decisions isn't a bad thing. Negotiating with other people is part of life. So the compromise that I'm talking about is really a question to you of, are you lowering your standards? Now you could say, Eleanor, there are things in life where I would like something to be this, to be up high, but like so-and-so is not with it. So I have to go a notch lower and they have to get in a, a notch higher. I get it. What I'm saying is, are you lowering your standards in multiple domains of your life to sustain this feeling of intimacy, this connection. So is your health suffering? Do you have a lot of anxiety? Are you stressed the fuck out at work? Like, do you not keep up with your social circle anymore? Financially, are you starting to take a hit? Are other domains of what once was doing pretty well you were able to maintain are you saying, okay, maybe I don't have to call so-and-so. Maybe I don't have to save this money. Maybe this, right? Are your standards lowering in different realms of your life? So that's something really important to look at uh, because that is what I believe is an indication of compromising in a way that is not uplifting you because that's the point with the compromise is the compromise should uplift the duo, both parties are all parties involved, right? It shouldn't make you feel worse about yourself in other ways. Kind of see what I'm saying here? So I talked about two key factors in knowing if you are compromising, because once again, this emotional validation dynamic is subconscious. Right. I just want to bring this series to bring it to the consciousness. 
So how do you know if you're compromising in a dynamic, right? You could just feel like you're being loving or you're being in service. But two things to look out for is if you're minimizing and what your boundaries look like. So if you are minimizing, what this means is you are downplaying the amount of effort you're exerting. So it's like, oh, no, it wasn't that big of a deal. Or I could do that really quick after work or, you know, in between this and this, I I can do that for you. Or you just don't say shit at all. You're like, yeah, I got it. I'll do it. Like you swallow it. You're swallowing all the things that you are doing. And you are once again, not communicating to what extent it's taking from you. Now, we do things all the time. We love people. We go out of our way. But what I really want to be clear on is if people love you, they don't want you to feel bad, right? Like if I asked a friend or my sister to do something and they were like, Eleanor, I would, I would really like to do that, but like I am wiped out today or I'm exhausted or I just don't have enough in the tank or it, it would really crunch my schedule. I'm happy to work with that. I'm happy to be like, okay, let me think of something else. Let me try something else. Let me reach out to someone different. And that's very powerful. And I think we don't do that enough. And it's important to be proactive about that type of communication and say, listen, I hear you. I would really like to do this for you. But in this moment, I'm blank. I'm tired. I'm stressed. I'm mentally preoccupied. I'm not in a position to have this conversation. Basically, I hear and I see your request. In this moment, I can't do this. Or you can say, I will go ahead and, and do this. But I did want you to know that that's going to push back my schedule 15 minutes for the rest of the day. So this is not to, to guilt anyone, to be manipulative. This is being honest. Because if you are going to compromise in a way that uplifts the duo, you need to communicate what is being exchanged. If you're doing something for them and you're losing a little something, you need to say that. You need to speak it. But people who are in relationship dynamics that is not beneficial for them, they're going to minimize. And then a lot of the time, that's when like resentment builds they don't feel seen. They don't feel like people are taking care of them, like they're taking care of who they are, right? And so that is a huge indication of when you are making those compromises, you're minimizing all that you're doing for them, the energy, the time, the effort that it took. Okay, yes. So the other thing about minimizing is a lot of the time it's because you don't want the other person to feel bad, right? Like, oh no, it's okay. I got it. Or yeah, don't worry about it. I can do it really quick. Or you've been working a lot. Oh, that's easy. I, I, it's on me. Don't, don't think anything twice. Don't think twice about it. That's the same. <laughs> so this was such a game changer when I heard it in one of Mina Irfan's courses where she explained that if you are trying to mediate, control, regulate, modulate someone else's emotions, it's not that they're controlling you and your time. You are also controlling them. Because if you were to let go of control, you would just speak honestly and you would let them have their reaction. You would let them respond the way that they wanted to respond and just let that be. But you are taking on that weight of their response and saying, okay, well, if I do this and this, or if I say it like this, and if I say yes, or, you know, and then I don't share this aspect with them, then they're not going to get too upset. They're not going to get angry, they'll, they won't raise their voice, whatever motives that you have going on. I think that's very, it's a very provocative idea that 
you wanting to regulate a room, someone's emotional is you controlling them. But I want to just offer that. I want to offer that thought because I think it's a really good one and I see the validity in it. So it happens where people minimize and then at some point take a, a victim role of like, well, I did this and this, and I've always done this and this, and, and I showed up here and I did this after the kids were done at school and blah, 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 blah. They have this long laundry list. All the while they were minimizing the true exertion of what it took from them, the compromises that they were making. And then, <laughs> what was I going to say? Um, and then it's like, wow, well, look at all the things I did for you. Look at this. Look how I go out of my way. I'm always the friend that shows up. I'm always the brother that you can count on. And now all of a sudden, it bubbles up and you want to be acknowledged for all that you've done, right? But you're trying to control them by either one, you're saying, don't worry about it. I'm going to make sure this person's happy. This person's in homeostasis. I'm going to control their own emotions by what I do for them. But then when I get upset about all that I've done for them, I'm going to start to claim it. I'm going to start to own all of the energy I put forth, even though I wasn't communicating that all along. And now look at what you've done to me. And so now you control them through guilt. Okay. It's, it's a very interesting kind of like reverse psychology that we do there, but really important to recognize. So the second key factor in compromising in ways that are unhealthy is <laughs> really looking at your boundaries. Shocker. This is a very oversaturated topic. I've heard some really interesting ideas on it. Um, and I'm going to talk about it more, but I, I do kind of get, I'm going to just look up, look at my draft real quick. Where it's like, ugh. So when we're thinking about your relationships and just take a second and be like, where am I compromising? Like, is it the workplace? Is it with my spouse? Is it with the person I'm dating? Is it with my like little sister? And part of what to look at with the boundaries is things that you once were very clear on, felt firm in, are now very fluid. So now, like if it was a hard, no, I'm going to work out every day after I'm done at work, period. And now it's like, okay, well, maybe I, I don't have to, or like, I guess if, you know, the kids have soccer practice, then I, I won't have to go then. So this is an example of if the boundary you once had for yourself was very clear and very firm, this is what you need. As soon as it becomes less rigid, what ends up happening is if too much of that happens, right? If you do that with your time, if you do that with your emotions, if you do that with your money, if you do that with your physical health, if you do that with your social circle, if the boundaries of what you had been working in the containers you set forth, if none of them have their shape anymore, then it becomes osmosis. People can come and go as they please. So this ends up being perceived as like your boundaries are actually just more preferences or like suggestions. Oh, well, I mean, he works out some of the time. So I'm going to just stop by Thursday afternoon because he doesn't always work out. So that's what is being. That's what's I guess readable isn't the correct word, but that's what people are picking up on. Now, another controversial idea from Mina Irfan with the boundaries that I really like is she teaches that boundaries are energetic first, which means you decide and 
from that decision, what is okay and what is not okay, and you moving in your life that reflect it is communication enough. And 90% of the time, that's very clear to someone. Now, there could be times where people question it, challenge it, um, try to get you to stray, and you may need to just like verbally acknowledge that or clarify something. But first and foremost, you have to decide. So if you are in a partnership where you feel like your boundaries aren't being respected, you actually haven't set any boundaries. If you feel like people are just coming in and out and fluid, you actually have not structured the container that you want to be in and where people can enter and exit. You haven't done that. You may think you've done it. You may think you don't stand for things. But at the end of the day, if it's still happening and in a way that is upsetting to you, because I think that's something to keep in mind is that when you're, I find anger <laughs> is actually reflective of some sort of violation. Not always. There's, there's a lot of different routes to feeling angry, but I do believe that violation is a large part of when we experience anger. Part of that violation is, once again, I feel like I'm being taken advantage of. I feel like I'm being taken for granted. I feel like I'm not being acknowledged or respected. And that is, once again, because people are just coming in and, and leaving and asking for things and then ducking out. So it's you. It's you who sets up the structure. It's you who sets up the container. Now, once again, there, here, hold on. I'm cat sitting, so I have to let the cat see. Now, I don't, I do want to acknowledge that there are some heinous violations of autonomy, of free will, and that is not a discussion that I necessarily want to have in this video, but I do recognize there are some really, really terrible things, and that's not what I'm covering like within this scope. So... I did want to bring it to our attention. I think it's a really powerful idea that boundaries, the more you speak them, the more you vocalize them, the less believable they are. It is you stop picking up phone calls. It is you stop going out with people. It is if someone says something disrespectful, you get up and walk away. You are the container and people know where they can enter and people know when they can't. So you set up that structure. Those are the boundaries. And if you feel like you're compromising because you feel, once again, taken advantage of, taken for granted, I would really implore you to be like, what is, what is my boundary here? And maybe what is something, what is the boundary that I desire? But then what is the boundary that's actually being embodied because they're probably different and I'm even still doing this work too I'm I have this as well where I think that I'm not available for something but it's a, I'm available so we're all addressing it next thing I want to talk about the boundaries okay so in the post, in, in the piece that I have written, I did some very simple real life examples. I know I've kind of been tossing them around, but I did like very specific bullet points. And I also included my diagram for emotional validation where you can see, okay, how are people being validated? What hidden addiction is it feeling? And then how does that lead to compromise? And so I give you several examples of each. So you can go ahead and click the link below to look at this. But to wrap up this video, 
now that we've talked about it, about being emotionally validated and that people are compromising and what it looks like within the compromise, now what? Now what do we do? So I have, looks like three, three things that I put together as far as like, let's move forward. Let's grow. Let's be better. How do I get out of being emotionally validated? Well, one that's validating yourself. That's not a big surprise there. But how do I move from this unskillful application of compromise to becoming more of a skillful application? So the first thing, actually, I think all of these are from Mina Irfan. So all three of these suggestions are from her YouTube channels, The Universe Guru, and I take her course. Um, so this is the information I got from her. So the first thing is own your desires without the story. So, so what I mean by that, just checking on, I don't know if you heard the meow is if you want to do something and then you have all of these reasons, this storyline, these justifications, the whys, the hows, the why nots, then once again, you're compromising your desire. So let's do an example. So let's say I want, um, I want to run a 5K. That's my desire. This year, this October, I'm going to run the 5K. That's your desire, period. Now, the desire with the story is, I wanna run a 5K in October, but I don't really know if I have enough time to train and the weather starts to get pretty cold come October. And I guess that means I'm gonna have to start eating different. And I don't know if I have the money or the time to go grocery shopping, but you know, it would it would be really cool. And I think I can, I can do it. Um, but I don't know. I, I do have a friend who's going and her husband's supportive, but I feel like my husband's going to want me home to make sure that like I, you know, finish up bedtime, blah, blah, blah. This is the story. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. The compromise usually has a story. <laughs> if someone is compromising and they know they shouldn't, they usually follow up with the justification. Like, um, yeah, I'm dating this guy and he's not working, but he's had a lot of like mental health problems and the video games help him relieve his stress. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's some justification or reason for why they're compromising in the way that they are. So to cut that shit out, cut out the story and own the desire. The desire is you want to run a 5k. The desire is you want to get married. The desire is you want to have the kids. The desire is you want to move states, period. Not, I want to get married, but I'm, you know, I'm 40. How many good men are left? They're going to have a lot of baggage because they're probably divorced. No. Or I want to move states, but man, the, has the economy really come back up yet? And I'm doing this job now. I could do another one. Um, and, but man, it would be really hard to pack, right? The, the compromise. Like I have to compromise. <laughs> Sorry, they want to back out. They're outdoors cats. But do you start to see what I'm saying? I don't want to get too repetitive really look at, okay, when I'm going through my life, when I say I do something, when I say I want something, when I say I need it, is there a story after? Is there a justification? Am I minimizing? Am I justifying? Don't do that. So that's the first thing. What now? Cut out the, the story. Just own the desire. Now, part of this is I put omit negative conjunctions. So basically I'm saying you can have it all. So omit the buts, the ifs, the like even those and put and. So 
let's see here. I, um, I want to go to Europe this summer, but I'm in grad school. Mm -mm. I want to go to Europe this summer and I'm in grad school. Um, I, I want to go shopping for some new clothes, but I don't get paid until next week. Should I really spend that money? I want to go shopping for new clothes and I get paid next week. Okay. So this is a big mindset shift because once again, you're working in a uplifting compromise of how, how do both parties come together? How do I have both desires integrate? How do I get both ideas to upgrade? So changing your languaging and the verbiage from like, but, you know, I don't know, even though, no, you get to have both, both and, both and, okay? I want to get married, but I have kids. I want to get married and I have kids, okay? So really shifting the mindset there. And you'll start to catch yourself on, okay, I have this idea for myself and then how you knock yourself down. But this, even though this, and of course I have this. No, this is the idea and this is where I'm at. This is what I'd like. This is where I am in the present. This is what I'm looking forward to. This is where I find myself right now. And, okay, and, and this is a really good act to once again, just start to validate yourself versus having someone else come in and say, oh, you want to go to Europe? How can I help you go to Europe? Blah, blah, blah. Right. Like, I mean, there's, you can receive different help and assistance from people, but I'm saying as soon as someone sees that you want to go to Europe, but you actually don't believe you could go to Europe because you're in graduate school, then that becomes leverage for them to connect and interact with you in ways that may not be for your best interest because you're placing hope in them, which is one of the nine hidden addictions. You can look at the link below. Need to feel hope. You're placing hope in them that this outcome will come for you versus being in the position where it's like, okay, maybe that person can help but I know it's going to happen regardless. So it's either this person or another person. It's either this situation or a different. And I want to go to Europe and I'm in grad school. This person wants to help me. Great. But it's not, oh, I feel like you're down energetically at a detriment, as I say, and someone comes in to fill you up. But then when they're removed, you feel down or they come to fill you up. And because this cup is full, then all the cups around you start to decrease. That's what I'm trying to avoid and what I want to point out. Okay, I think the final thing. <laughs> okay, kind of what we were just finishing. I put, have faith in the creation of your desire and, I capitalized all caps, bitch, and the self-worth to believe you can receive it. So same thing. If you believe in a higher power, great. If you don't believe in a higher power, also great. There's the twofold. You have to believe that it's possible. The creation is possible, okay? So you either delegate that to God or to the universe, the cosmos, science, whatever thing you perceive as greater than yourself that creates your reality with you, you delegate that desire to them, or you believe in yourself. And you say, okay, I know that like, I have some grit. I know I have a focused mindset. I know I've overcame some tough shit before. I can do it. You have to have the belief. So whether it's outside of you, 
excellent. Or if you don't vibe with that, you have to build up the belief within you. Okay. After the belief that it's possible, right? You get to, you know, go party in Barbados and then be back home for a family Christmas. Once you believe it's doable, then you have to feel that you are deserving to receive it, that you can have the best of both worlds. So I think this is where I'll wrap up with compromise is we really want to make sure as you're looking in dynamics in your relationships, that a compromise is once again, bringing both things together. We're thinking and both parties are receiving a benefit. The group, the unit is going to be uplifted, even if it's not exactly what you wanted or what you were hoping for or what would have been best for you individually. But you see the benefit of the group, okay? So if you are compromising in ways that you're hitting a descent in any other area of your life, and sometimes what happens if you get mixed up in a really terrible relationship, it can become all areas of your life. But to make sure that those compromises aren't really putting you at a further detriment. And you have to be able to look at yourself and say, what is this job? What is this relationship? What is this friendship validating within me that I'm compromising my life for? I'm compromising my well-being, my mental health. All for what? To feel like what? And really taking that time to look and see, okay, wow, this is something that I really feel is important to me because all other areas of my life are being sacrificed in some way. So it takes time. It takes examination and taking a really, really close look. But I'll go ahead and wrap this up next week. Um, we'll talk about toleration. Uh, and then once again, uh, subscribe to The Conversationalist. That is my publication where I post all of my writings. This video will be there. It's email subscription. So I'd love to have you join the conversation and keep up with more of my work. Um, or you could subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't already, but the links are below. And as always, just some thoughts.